And uh, thank you very much, Richard and uh, Moses and the whole gang for inviting me to speak here. What a wonderful, wonderful kind of meeting. Already been some great moments. Today alone, my goodness, cosmology, evolutionary theory, um, a visit with Norman Jewison, a great, one of our most successful revolutionaries from Canada, and that brain, that brain. I thought I'd seen just about everything there is to rip off in American network television. I was taking notes. Uh, reporters, perverse creatures that we are, love the word censor. Sometimes I like to just stop and say it. Censor, censorship, just makes me boil over. I just feel so aggressive because whether it's an oil company trying to keep you from their natural gas well blowing out of control, polluting the atmosphere, or the Pentagon and the Bush White House trying to keep you 200 miles from the front to try to control reporting and coverage of the Gulf War, censorship always means that somebody has something very juicy to hide. And it's always in the public interest to find out what it is and tell people about it. It's our journalistic call to arms. It's tally-ho, expose the bastards. And so it is that uh, a colleague of mine, a colleague of mine who covers the war in Afghanistan, told me when I arrived there this past spring in Kabul, we love our Taliban and the militant Islamic regime, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, they are indeed the most ruthless military and political censors that many of us have ever encountered. And as you'll see, they've got uh, plenty to hide. It was exactly uh, 20 years ago that I returned here to Toronto from my first visit to Afghanistan. And when the uh, Ted City group got in, in touch with me, I wondered what I could possibly contribute to such uh, an array of outstanding thinkers and doers, not just speakers. So I decided to bring you this story. When you watch this, why Afghanistan? Well, we've got to remember that our high-tech rich, wealthy Western democracies had a lot to do with putting this country where it is today. When you watch this, don't just watch it out of sympathy for the Afghans, people in the third world who are in a very bad spot. Feel free to feel a little enlightened self-interest because the message is that if our democracies, if our wealthy developed countries continue to practice this kind of hit and run foreign policy, then we can't be surprised when the wreckage lands on our front doorstep in the form of Osama bin Laden, unwanted refugee migrations, you name it. If we're really interested in pushing back the horizons of technology and entertainment and design and everything else, all the other wonderful ideas that we've been talking about here, then we've got some old business from the last century to clean up. And I think, as you'll see, Afghanistan's a good place to start. Anyway, maybe we could uh, take a look at the tape. It used to be like this, photographing and recording in Afghanistan. 
with Mujahideen guerrillas creeping close enough to their communist regime enemies that you could see what they'd had for lunch. Or capturing footage of Soviet warplanes pounding villages, killing civilians. Or a close encounter between a Stinger heat-seeking missile and a MiG-21. Today, the Afghans are living in their 23rd consecutive year of warfare. Sadly, there's still combat to photograph, but in Kabul, the capital, controlled for the past four years by the militant Taliban regime, there's an even more challenging and difficult subject to get on tape. Little girls, little girls at school. The Taliban, resorting to extreme interpretations of Islamic teachings, have restricted schooling to boys only. These children and their teachers and their parents are risking prison sentences or worse just to pursue the dream of education. This is a secret school located in a private residence in Kabul. Afghan families are forced into a shadow existence. Music has been outlawed by the Taliban. Amir John and his sidemen are professionals who follow a musical tradition going back virtually to the start of recorded human history in this region. But they must do it as refugees in Pakistan. At home, they would be jailed by the Taliban religious police. Trying to work in Kabul, I too have to mask everything I do. Television news cameras have been declared instruments of Satan by the Taliban. I'm forced to roam with hidden cameras the streets of a city I've photographed freely for many years. Back in the 1980s, during the Soviet occupation, women in the cities had the choice to live openly. Afghan society had been modernizing and opening up to the West long before the Russians invaded. As recently as my visit in 1994, five years after the Soviet withdrawal and as civil war raged among the former Mujahideen groups, Afghan women still provided much of the skilled labor force in the capital. Today, all women have been forced into harsh segregation and most have lost their jobs. They have to conceal themselves beneath the flowing robes of the burqa and I must record them surreptitiously. Taliban foreign ministry officials warn me that if I'm caught using a camera in the streets, I'll be arrested and expelled from the country. So. Are the Taliban protecting the people from nosy, un-Islamic foreigners? Or are they hiding something? The Taliban, according to international aid specialists, are failing to develop any recognizable form of public services, especially in health care and education. When I questioned Taliban functionaries about this, they blamed continuing warfare for using up scarce resources. But these officials and the clerics who command them have had control of Kabul, the capital, for four years. That's been enough time to introduce Sharia law, including execution without trial for offenses ranging from adultery to murder. But public services? This is what I found in one high school, badly scarred by fighting among Afghanistan's warlords. Teachers are repairing the school. Though the teachers and students welcome me, I use a hidden camera. There can be no suggestion they knowingly helped me to make these recordings. Biology. This used to be one of the finest schools in the country. This was library. This was library? Yes, library. Before? Before. Who, where are the books? The books were burned or stolen. Every classroom is open to the elements. You are getting help from Afghan government? No, no. Taking all of this in is like pulling back the veil on the Taliban's administration. You come to school, you risk your life. Yeah. Where I come from, many students, <coughs> they have no problems and they skip school, they miss school. <laughs> 60,000? The Taliban's failure to invest in public services is not for want of money. The United Nations reports that the regime controls a criminalized war economy. 
It's estimated that the smuggling of goods into neighboring markets like Pakistan nets between one and two billion dollars annually. And 97% of the opium poppies grown in Afghanistan come from areas under Taliban control. These fields produced three quarters of the world's opium in 1999. During my visit, the Taliban government was eager to demonstrate that it was clamping down on the illicit trade by burning some of the crop in Nangahar province. But this is what I found just a few days later in the neighboring province, between 30 and 40 percent of arable land supporting high-yield white or red poppies. To civilian farmers, it's a reliable cash crop, but they receive not much more money for raw opium resin than from their wheat. The real profits are taken by refiners and traffickers, taxed heavily by the Taliban regime. Deeply contrasting images remain with me following this visit. First, in the countryside north of Kabul, beyond Taliban control, hundreds of Afghan farmers labor single-mindedly to rebuild an irrigation canal that will bring water to 2,000 family farms. Most Afghans are eager to rebuild, by hand if necessary, boulder by boulder. Yet this reconstruction of wartime damage goes on less than five miles from the front line where fighters from the Northern Alliance prepare for the next battle with their Taliban enemies. The village streets here are nearly empty of civilians. Most of them have fled here to Pakistan. These canvas peaks and rooftops are depressingly familiar. Since my first visit to this region in 1980, the specter of refugees fleeing war has filled my camera lens. The children, as always, are delighted to be photographed. But even these faces can't hide the crushing sense of dependency of the camps. The United Nations states that the Afghans were the 20th century's largest single flood of refugees from war. Today, they are the early 21st century's biggest refugee nationality. So, 23 years and counting, but there's, there's good news. There's good news because if we approach this problem, if our governments approach this problem in a thinking, analytical, and determined way, this is a great time to solve this quarter century old conflict and bring stability to a part of Asia that is, of course, nuclearized standoff between Pakistan and India. That's because there's a drought. There's a drought in southwestern Afghanistan. That's the Taliban heartland. That means that this year there aren't going to be as many poppies. There's not going to be as much money to cream. And a lot of the people who live in the southwest of Afghanistan are going to be turning to the Taliban for that social assistance, for water, for food, for seed, for relief. They don't have it. They can't supply it. At the same time, their enemies, backed by Iran uh, to the west, the former southern Soviet republics to the north, are militarily stronger. So the Taliban are, have got this military threat staring them in the face on many fronts. They're spread too thin. Most important, their great backer, the Pakistani military intelligence branch, is almost bankrupt. Pakistan is dangling on the end of Western aid and needs help and needs to negotiate. This is very much a time. The Taliban have never been as vulnerable or as malleable as they are now. If Western governments acted, this problem could be solved. Sometimes when I and other correspondents come back from a place like this here, you know, this was just a few weeks ago, these, these scenes haven't been seen or shown anywhere else. When we come back, people say, oh, wow, how do you feel? That must have been really bad news. You know, I was thrilled to get back. It's been six years since I've been in Kabul. It was wonderful to play the game again, this time with the Taliban. You know, you can see how effective they are. Not very. But 
I feel. It's always the same. When I come back here, I feel like the future, you know, it seems to me like a giant. And one of his feet is planted here on this wonderful society we have. Wealthy, rich, high tech. We're, we're here talking about all these wonderful ideas and a great telecommunications policy. But unfortunately, that giant's other foot is planted in Afghanistan. And in the rest of the world, the majority of the world, Africa, Middle East, Russia, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, so many places, the Fiji, the Solomon Islands, for goodness sake. So much of the world is looking to the wealthy West for leadership and relief and deliverance. And instead, we're giving this, oh, don't worry, there'll be trickle down from the Microsoft breakup. You know, <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. We, we have to, we have to look to our governments. We have to force our governments to do things. And that leads us back to information and the problem we have collecting and presenting this information. You know, how, how is it that our countries imagine themselves to be uh, on the leading edge of the information age when I'm home in North America? I don't see a lot of information around from the real world. And that's because of censorship. Censorship, The worst and most effective, in my, in my experience, form of censorship, commercial censorship. Any army or group of zealots like the Taliban can be worked around. You saw how I was, how I was able to photograph in Kabul. You can always beat a gang of zealots or military police. You can always do that. But what we haven't been able to solve yet is commercial censorship this failing of our networks to broadcast to you, to the public in North America, information from the rest of the world that you don't necessarily realize you need to know. That's news. And so what we are trying to do, many of us who still work in foreign news, is to solve this problem. There is some good news there as well. We'll make money with our latest documentary in Afghanistan. We have to. We have to make foreign news pay. The networks have told us that it just isn't going to get on the air unless we do. That's the challenge we have, the challenge we have of gathering an audience and trying to reverse this terrible programming craze that we're existing under here in North America, where only the news that scores a huge rating, only the soap operas that are guaranteed to bring an audience, they, only the easy stuff gets on. The difficult stuff we don't listen to. I'd just like to leave you with this thought, and it is, is simply this. Uh, a culture whose communications elite and the corporations that control it feels that it cannot afford any longer to remain informed What's, with what's going on in most of the world, with most of the world's population, is a culture that's doomed to fail. Whether it's your cottage in the country, or your internet business, your dreams of your own web, website, our dreams of operating and owning our own network, whatever our own peculiar Western developed high-tech fascinations might be, they won't be possible if the world economy succumbs, as it could if this kind of thing is allowed to fester. Forget Osama bin Laden. You ain't seen nothing like it from here, from many other places. It really could be an enormous, enormous eruption, the like of which we haven't seen. Is that the 21st century we want? I don't think so. So, gee, Richard, I'm sorry to start the evening session on such a downer. The, I'm still doing this. You know, Kevin, other journalists, we're still in it. We're still trying to do quality broadcasting, so it must mean there's hope. We see the hope there. And uh, I'd just like, again, to say thank you very much for inviting those of us 
representing an industry in decline and in tough times, to join those of you who are powering to the top. Thanks a lot.